Hello and welcome to on the podcast of the Odd Couple. This is Siddharth here, and I'm Dr. Shish. So today we are honored to have with us Mr. Vivek Menon, who is a wildlife conservationist, environmental commentator. author and a photographer with a passion for elephants he's been part of the founding of five environmental and nature conservation organizations in india the winner of the 2001 rufford award for international conservation for his work to save the asian elephants vivek is the founder executive director and ceo of the wildlife trust of india as well as the senior advisor to the international fund for animal welfare he has trained wildlife officers of over 50 countries in wildlife crime prevention He is also an author or editor of over 10 wildlife books including the recently published Secret Lives of Mammals for Children and the best selling book Indian Mammals a Field Guide which I can't recommend enough. So welcome to the Odd Couple podcast Vivek so thrilled to have you here with us. Thanks Sid and thanks doctor good to be with you. So Mr Vivek I mean you've got a astounding number of achievements behind you so thank you for coming on our show we're a very small podcast and we're so happy to have somebody like you on our show. So where did this all begin where's this passion for environmental protection because that's not something which is very lucrative not too many people are really interested in going down that avenue right so what what made you think about it it's uh, it's not not too lucrative it's not lucrative at all and <laughs> anybody who wants a lu- lu- lucrative <laughs> career should not come anywhere near the work that one tries to do but to answer your um, question itself uh, i suppose my my love for animals came very young very early so there was no question of considering lu- lucrativeness or not uh, it was it is way beyond uh, before that uh, it was in school um, and i had i had a period of life when i was in kerala and then i had a period of life when i was in punjab so two two ends of the country and while one uh, exposed me to elephants and and forests and uh, and the verdancy of kerala the other exposed me to the himalayas because uh, the school i was in at that stage especially senior school encouraged a lot of trekking um, so every, every year we were out in the himalayas for long periods of time and and not in the short school excursions do nowadays so it was it was really wild and we had to really go out and i suppose therefore the 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 uh, passion for nature came at that stage very early on so so just for our audience to understand uh, which era was this this is like um... era era you make it make it sound uh, <laughs> <laughs> make it sound like a mauryan era or something no, no, because was, you know <laughs> this was a uh, this was a 70s let's let's put it 70s which is a sort of an era in themselves right okay <laughs> so so i i'm assuming there was a there was much more flora and fauna during the 70s than there is today because the um, rapid destruction has been like crazy i mean like every 20 30 years we're like losing 50 and 60% of what we have so you know so i'm assuming you had a lot of flora and fauna to be really inspired by it yeah no no we have uh, plenty of flora and fauna now uh, doc that i'm still inspired by i still spend 15 days to 20 days uh, in the forest and i'm still inspired by it and uh, there's still plenty we have despite the destruction that you're talking about so it's it's a it's a ironical thing that and i'm outside this country for example whenever i give talks uh, abroad i always tell them just as as a one liner that can catch people's attention that we have 65% of the world's tigers right uh, 75 to 80% of the elephants in asia the asian elephant the african elephant is a different thing uh, and uh, 80 to 90% of the rhino in asia okay and 100% of the asian lion Okay, just four animals that I mention, despite 1.2 billion people. And the reason I mention these animals are that they're big. And between these four that I mention, they uh, kill uh, approximately 100 people a year. So these are not, uh, you know, pussy cats that you live with. These are uh, wild animals of a certain size that require certain habitat. And still we have them. So there's plenty. But you're right. In the 70s, there were there was much more. You're right. and there are areas that i have walked through both in, in the bo- in the two areas i have talked about in kerala there, there have been forests that i walked through in the early 80s not 70s early 80s which are now uh, ganja fields and uh, I, there are areas that i have uh, you know walked through in high altitude with snow in it which now is cactus so yes i have seen changes and in 25 years you should not go back you know 25 years later 30 years later you should never go back to the place you walked in you should find new places ne- never visit an old girlfriend of yours <laughs> <laughs> absolutely well put well put golden words indeed but talking about how this whole forest area is shrinking or let me put it the other way that 
the urban area is increasing or the civilization is slowly eating up into the forest area and as you said either it's for agriculture or it's for even even for staying there's huge huge amount of conflict with human and wildlife and then you see horrid uh, pictures like what you had posted recently about a leopard being snagged in a snare and suffered for more than 40 hours before it died or the horrible scene where a, a elephant ate a, a pineapple with a explosive in it had died a horrible death so how do we solve this issue? I mean, is there a solution in a country like India or is there an alternative way that we can yeah, So there, there are no solutions. Yeah. The, these, even even in, in conservation and parlance or government parlance, we call it mitigation, right? Mitigation means what? Means you can try to make it a little better. Uh, there, there's no solution. Uh, I mean, uh, you've got a doctor, I know he's not a corona specialist, but if you ask him as a doctor, what is your solution for mm-hmm. corona? There is no solution. You, you have a, a series of steps that mitigate a particular extenuating circumstance, right? So, a conflict is nothing new. From the Rig Veda, there's conflict, right? And Rig Veda, which is slightly before me, before my era, by the way, as, as you called it, right? <laughs> so, so uh, 4,000 years ago, if that's when we think the Vedas were written, uh, there's mention of elephant conflict, okay? There, there's seals, seals of an elephant showing a a something that looks like a cloth on it. So obviously a, a tamed elephant. It's not a wild elephant. So at that time also they were catching elephants. Right? Similarly, if you look at Arthashastra, which is what, two and a half thousand years ago, um, Kautilya, who people think wrote it anyway, it's Chandragupta Maurya's time, yeah? and he had the largest stable of captive elephants in India ever. So um, at his stage, Arthashastra, there's a whole chapter on elephants. And there's a chapter on how elephants should be protected. There's also a chapter on elephant conflict. There's a chapter which says that you have to leave aside places for elephants called Gajavanas. They say, you know, places where elephants procreate is not places like you and me. He says, oh, emperor, leave aside this. And he actually puts a map and he says, in your age. So two things in this. One is that conflict is not new. It's, it's, it's old. The second thing is, by the way, as a side, really, is that uh, when people, when I go out and people say that, you know, the, the uh, British act to prevent cruelty to animals is the first animal uh, welfare act. Or when they say, tell me in the US that the Yellowstone is the world's first national park, I laugh. Because it's two and a half thousand years ago. We've got a map of areas which was proclaimed by Chandragupta Maurya as Gajavanas. And where he put a chief elephant warden, he calls him that elephant warden. And he says that if anybody goes into my forest, there's a penalty on it. You know, this is how much Ashraf you have to pay. And, uh, and, or, and, he, and the only difference is there was no book called a law. But he put it on inscriptions, right? Ashoka later fin- uh, you know, finished it off, his grandson finished it off an inscription, one which is outside my, my house. Still there. It's a, it's a pillar. So just because I wrote on stone. That was probably one of the first reservations which we know about, like, you know. What I know of in my 35 years of work, I can tell you, that's the oldest that I know of. Okay. Okay. In terms of an act, it's really an act. It's an emperor saying, this is what I want you to do. And if you don't do it, there's a punishment. That's an act. It's a law, right? And, and the fact that it's the first national park. I mean, they, they, he says Gajavana, this is how it should be protected. This is for elephants, this is for this thing, etc. It's the very first that I know of. If anybody can contest me, it can only be the Chinese or the Egyptians. They're the only ones who are older or, or the same vintage. The Americans cannot tell me that Yellowstone is the first one, right? I mean, that, that, that's a laugh. That's Correct. a hoot. That's so true. No, but when we talk about conflict, sometimes we, we tend to speak for the elephants, but really isn't the conflict between we humans who who are affected by these elephants, right? The guys who have agriculture. Like, let's talk about a region called Hassan in Karnataka. I mean, they've got humans and, and, and elephants living in the same region, right? So most of the time, these elephants are encroaching into their fields and destroying their crops and people get mad. Then what happens is the people are like, let's get rid of these elephants. But then we've got NGOs such as yours, which comes in and then is trying to create an environment where the animal and the humans can live together, right? Without thing. But at the end of the day, isn't it a conflict between just the you and the other human? Because the a- animal has nothing to say. So at the end of the day, it's like you're, yeah. you're fighting a battle which is uphill. So so that's why I wanted you to throw some light probably coming in from a side of, you know, where you have to fight for something which has no say in this at all. Yeah, so uh, the g- great set of uh, reflections. They're not questions, they're reflections. There are many, many parts of what you said. You see? Correct. I mean, but first let me uh, address uh, phraseology, right? You said 
for example i mean you, you used hasan as an example a well known example but hasan is not unique all of india we have 29000 elephants in the wild maybe 30 something like that right and we have 1.2 billion human beings and right through the place where these 30000 elephants live with human beings there are issues i can't think of any area in india where there is no issue okay um, because elephants are living cheek and jowl with people now you said that you know elephants uh, encroach into areas where people have uh, uh, agriculture and they cause damage sure that's one way of putting it right and that and that's actually a more civil way of putting it than most uh, newspapers do when they say you know monstrous elephants especially in kerala monstrous elephants coming out of uh, the forests and destroying people's hard earned livelihood and probably true as i said elephants kill 100 people uh, sorry uh, what did i say i'm saying something wrong elephants kill about 400 people a year right uh, we kill about 100 elephants elephants are winning actually a little more intelligent than us they kill about 400 indians a year but we are making much more more rapidly in every hour so you know yeah but but now i'm i'm talking about phraseology yes absolutely neither did the media nor did you in a podcast ever say that we encroached into the elephant habitat right no, elephants did not encroach into our habitat before we encroached into their habitat when the british built roads whether in kerala and wayanad where my grandfather was a doctor long ago and the british used to come on horseback to build those roads and i used to hear from him how those roads were built cutting through the steps of wayanad or in the himalayas the british engineers used a very simple theory they chose the most stable gradient to build the roads what was the most stable gradient they used elephant footpaths wherever the elephant put its foot will be the most stable part to build a road and this good engineering very bad for the elephant so the elephant when i explain to you or to a child or to a president and i explain to all three levels uh, all my life i explain the elephant in four words an elephant is a big intelligent social nomad and you must understand these four words and they're linked uh, big is linked at least to nomad but the big in biology big a child will also say an elephant is big any child across the world will say an elephant is big an elephant is by the way across the world across cultures the most instantly recognizable animal right correct e is for elephant in any any language e is not for egg or excitement or anything else if you ask any language e for e for elephant so although they know it the first thing that comes to any child is that the elephant is big but there's a biological definition it's a mega herbivore means 1000 kilos or more and eats a certain amount of grass and forage right and browse if it needs that sort of food it has to be a nomad it has to move so that the forest or the grassland regenerates behind it and it comes back cyclically across a year and comes back into it. that is the biology of the being so you can't settle it you can't like Yeah, you know, certain other animals say that your elephant has come out of your forest. No, no, no. Elephants move across landscapes. Sorry, Project Elephant reserves include more, many of our towns which have come up today. You know, Jamshedpur, Ranchi comes in the middle of our Project Elephant reserve. For I'm just giving an example. Many towns today's towns are coming up in elephants. No, I was recently was driving from uh, what is it, uh, Bangalore to Chennai, and uh, somewhere past uh, Hosur and just before Krishnagiri. I saw a board which said that slow down elephant crossing, but I've never seen an elephant cross that uh, path. There are plenty of elephants there. Then Gan, then Gani Kote. Are they poor in soil but but rich in elephants? Uh, please read even uh, Kenneth Anderson. But Kenneth Anderson also wrote scandalous stuff. He also said poor in soil, rich in comely lasses. But uh, that is the area you are talking of, right? <laughs> uh, also rich in elephants. I've I've camped there overnight and seen twenty six to twenty eight elephants uh, playing in a in a in a, in a water pool. in the 1980s so very much rich in elephants and elephants used to go through that area towards uh, bangalore then karnataka shut its doors and moved towards andhra it actually went into tirupati area uh, in the 90s and then it got cut off again there so it is a series of cutting offs that we are doing through linear infrastructure through our agriculture through our settlements as uh, sid said as a result we are cutting them off so these nomads can't move But as I said, they are also social. Remember, very social means groups, herds, families, kins beyond herds, uh, just like us. In fact, very much like me and and Sid. I don't know about you, but definitely like the two of us. We are matrilineal. Elephants are also matrilineal. Right. Okay. Very much a Nair community or a Garo community. If you can, if I can look at two Indian 
uh, examples to you. Led by a, a woman and uh, follows that herd structure and men after a certain age get out okay, and find their own, own, own ladies in different herd. They're also intelligent. They're more intelligent than, than most uh, of my friends. They are so close to us in consciousness, memory, grief, joy, ability to, uh, to connect things intergenerationally that I call them near persons. And I'm not saying this emotionally. As, as a scientist, I'm saying that I call them near persons, right? Uh, when, when the average person says it, people say it is uh, emotional. So uh, now that I am the chair of the Asian Elephant Specialist Group for 10 years, I can tell you that, right? I, I do consider them very close to us. We should really call them persons. If you if you really devolve personhood into a mathematical formula of, as I said, memory and consciousness and all that. There, so many of these things rank up so high. They hit that barrier so much, just like some of the great apes and even some of the whales do that. And they hit these barriers so much that if you didn't believe in a religious uh, definition of humanity and personhood, if you went totally by biology, then you would call them persons. But if you are arrogant enough to think that you are different, then at least call them near persons, I'm saying. They're very, very close to us. Nice. So on that actually amazingly profound note, we'll just take a quick break. You're listening to the Odd Couple Podcast. Odd Couple Podcast. A Pandemia Inc. production. Are you ready? A friendly fireside chat with friends where no topic is beyond a healthy discussion punctuated with a laugh or two. Check it out! Tune in every fortnight on your favorite podcast network. Welcome back. And with us, we have Mr. Vivek and environmental conservation list and we were talking about how the elephants and humans have their conflicts and how NGOs help in managing it so I just wanted to continue continue with the old question which was like so when these type of scenarios happen where you know there is a conflict area how does it get resolved because very often people will make it political and then political parties come inside to represent the people because everything is a vote bank in today, right? So they come in and then they have to start siding with people. So then ultimately, at the end of the day, the animal will lose, right? In the sense, because then they are asked to be moved out. And where do they move these animals to? So uh, absolutely. So perplexing uh, question. So just like you said, anybody who's half intelligent will know that, that eventually human beings win. And what you need is is what is uh, what matters. Uh, other life forms don't. Actually, if I look at India, and I'm not looking at Kerala or Assam, which you gave an example of. If I look at all over India, it still is one of the most tolerant countries. And as I said, uh, I gave you a statistic: 400 elephants, uh, 400 people killed by elephants. But we still call it God, more or less, across India, uh, except in pockets where you know. Uh, that tolerance is completely gone. But actually, tolerance is very high. In in the US, when a, a, a wolf kills three sheep, it's called three strikes around. It's a baseball thing. They shoot the wolf. Here, after the elephant kills five people, we still say, Ganesh ji, let's <laughs> think. You know, and then the chief ally warden sits on it and thinks. And, you know, eventually, as you said, there's some political pressure, then something else. Generally, we don't want to kill. Even if we want to then do something to the elephant, we try to capture it and actually give it through much more agony than had we shot it, but we do shoot it. So we would capture it, tame it, train it, you know, beat it, starve it, and, and then say this is our way of love for the elephant. But we, So we are a very strange set of people. Uh, but coming to your point, what do we do as an NGO? As civil society, you, you, you form a bridge between uh, the state and, and your own representatives, which is the people. For your mandate, which in my case is nature, right? So nature conservation, if it's my mandate, I must represent that mandate, whether, as you said, they are voiceless or not. My job is to represent them well, just like anybody represents their community to their local MLA or something. I have to represent my elephants or tigers or whatever else it is. Yeah, well, but I, as a scientist also and as a technical person and leading a group of uh, more than 200 scientists and technical people, I can tell them how to do it also. So in many of these areas, we have shown models of uh, what we call rite of passage, that if you allow, the, in this case, elephant, you've been talking elephants, but I can also talk tigers or lions or anything else. Right? Also, we, we deal with all sorts of animals across the country. But elephants especially, if you give them rite of passage, as I said, they're intelligent animals and they don't necessarily cause harm. 
if you allow them to move on certain routes that they want to move. And you cannot say, I've got a national highway here. You have to put an overbridge and allow them to move. Right? If you don't do that and you channelize them into areas where you want them to go and they don't want to go, then they will cause damage. Elephants understand the message of love as they're intelligent. Not necessarily all animals, but elephants do. And they understand you're giving them right of passage. And that itself can be a big uh, uh, solution. Okay? But the other solutions are so many. You are saying elephants come into crops. That's a whole different thing. Elephants do not, do not go into crops necessarily to move. They go into crops because... Why don't you eat grass? Crop crop is a form of grass, right? Why don't you or I eat grass for our dinner? And as I said, elephants are a little more intelligent than you or me. So we don't eat it because we don't get enough nutrition from it. With a little bit of rice or or roti or something, we get far more nutrients, which is a grass. But you want the elephant to eat grass. Elephant also realize that this ragi or, uh, you know, wheat or rice has got far more nutrients. And most of the Indians are not killing elephants. I never thought about it that way. <laughs> low, low, low risk, high gain. Yeah, people don't think about uh, these things because they don't they don't think of animals as intelligent beings. Correct. And it's and it's not just elephants. It cuts across species. When I bought my farmland in Wayanad and I started farming, uh, I, I remember all my neighbors were putting pesticides. I didn't. I used all anything. And people used to tell me, "Oh, animals will come and destroy your crop." And they tried many things. I showed them how to put an electric fence. How elephants won't come in which part you guard, which part you allow them to move, etc. So then the a man next door came and said, you can see in your area, all the birds are coming. So your birds are going to eat one third of your rice paddy. So I said, Santosh, that was his name. And I said, uh, you know, for the bird, there's no barrier between your field and mine. They're adjoining. They're coming to mine and eating, not eating in yours, right? So I said, in English, there's a saying, bird brain. I said, I can apply it to you as a human being. Bird has more brains than you. If it chooses my crop over your crop, I said, your sons and my sons are the same age. You are giving them poison to eat. The bird can recognize that poison and is coming to my thing and eating. I said, let it eat a little bit. The remaining I'll give my children. They'll grow taller and bigger and, and uh, you know live longer than yours. Because the bird is not descending, although there is no barrier for that bird. So think of animals and birds as intelligent creatures. They know when you put pesticide and when you don't. They come, so you can use nature as a mechanism of leading intelligent lives yourself, according to me. You know, they're great indicators, they're great, uh, they tell you things, if you have the time and the intelligence to listen. So true, because because I, I get this whole we encroaching on their space and, and leading to this conflict and everything. But what's worse is that we go in and hunt them down for economic gain, like like poaching and stuff like that. And it's so sad what's happening to elephants and tigers and rhinos and pretty much anything with any kind of economic value. Uh, it's plundered uh, beyond um, controllable things. And I see it's been increasing a lot. And I remember a lot of sting operations done to capture this kind of goods and these contrabands which are being exported across the world. So how do you go about controlling this, especially when it's economic, right? People don't have money to buy food and they're actually forced to get into poaching and smuggling. Uh, yeah, my, yeah I'll, I'll tell you. And this, in a way, is supposed to be my specialty of sorts. So I should tell you. And I must correct you on at least two other things you said. So in the early 90s, that's all I did, focusing on the poaching and uh, trade. In fact, I was undercover for many years, tracking the ivory trade and tiger trade, right on trade. And uh, in those days, I was not thinking of conflict. In fact, conflict was not such a big thing. It was there. It's getting bigger and bigger by the day. So my first uh, counter to your thing is poaching is actually not getting worse. From what I've seen it in the early 90s, it's actually going down. Hmm, okay. If you look at all parameters of poaching, and I'm not talking about what comes on um, media or in the next press or Madhubhumi front page. I'm talking about data. If you look at data, 90s was much worse for us, for tiger, for rhino, and for elephant. Three examples I'm giving. Okay, but you can take many other things. Many, many, many more elephants and rhinos and tigers were poached. Twice the country declared a national tiger crisis. I was behind uh, both of them in some way for the government to declare. And both were due to poaching, not due to conflict. Okay, so it actually, over the years, we have gained control over 
which that doesn't mean it doesn't happen. You know, robbery doesn't stop, rape doesn't stop, murder doesn't stop. So crimes continue. Crimes are still there. They are uh, rearing their head now as we talk. Uh, the last two, three years, there's a slight, slight upsurge in southern India. If that's what uh, you are referring to, there is a upsurge. But overall in the country, it's still not such a bad scenario. Elephant. In Tiger, actually, it's much, much, much better okay, than what it was. Uh, rhino is a fighting game one day, uh, bad in one day. Uh, this thing. So, uh, po- poaching uh, is something which is completely different from conflict. You have to deal with it differently. Now, you said while it's economic and people do it. Yeah, partially, partially. Most of these poaching, the money is made by certain gangs. Okay, This has nothing to do with economics. These are all well-to-do people who make millions of dollars. They need to be put behind bars and made accountable to the crime that they commit. Wildlife crime is worth several billion dollars annually. It's a huge international crime. It's, it's a third after guns and narcotics and uh, and possibly uh, the flesh trade. Right? Um, this, this is one of the largest illegal crimes in the world. So don't, don't link it to economics necessarily. No, I meant economics because the person who actually goes and poaches are ones who are struggling to make a living and struggling to get a meal. Yeah, yeah. Yes, there are larger cartels in play who are making the big bucks. But the person who probably chops off a rhino or horn and makes a couple of dollars for it. No, no, much less, much less. A rhino horn costs around dollars a pound. No, 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 no. Don't, 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 don't give these figures. Remember, contraband has no value. So first, in your podcast or in any media thing, I keep saying, do not give values for anything. Number one, even if you are right, you are actually spurring a trade Absolutely by people right. who are listening yeah. to you. But you are wrong because your $1,000 or anything, all these sort of things that people give are based on extrapolation of the final cost that an oriental person, a Chinese largely, or some of the other oriental countries will pay for the medicine. The medicine is consumed in chians. Chians are hundreds of grams. So you take that hundreds of a gram and the final price in the medicine and then extrapolate it to a horn and you give mm-hmm, a, mm-hmm, a strange mm-hmm. figure. But nobody ever makes that. So uh, so even in terms of uh, fact, it's wrong. But even I'm saying even if it's right, never give a figure on any podcast or, or media thing because it just spurs a, a trade unnecessary. That, which is why in narcotics, they say there's no price. These are uh, contraband. Now, dealing with that, you asked how to tackle it, right? Dealing with that is totally different to dealing with conflict. Conflict when elephants or things are coming into somebody's field and eating the grain, which will give them the next dinner and or that's that's really livelihood. Yes, lot of the trade thing, lot of the trade thing is not livelihood. It's not spurred by livelihood. It's not spurred by poor people. They do use poor people. So the, the trick is not to go for the bottom. So when we used to do enforcement, which I have, you said in your introduction to me that I have trained fifty countries. I have trained more than that, but anyway. I trained them in enforcement. I was an enforcement specialist. Right? When you catch a cartel, you go an hourglass figure. There are lots of poachers. There are lots of users. You do not catch the poachers. You do not catch the users. You actually go for the hourglass where it pinches and that's the trade. The traders and the people who deal in it, when you try to stop drug use, you don't go at all the people who use drugs, uh, which is fashionable nowadays to catch a Bollywood starlet and put behind bar. That does not solve the drug trade. Yeah, You have to catch the drug cartels. You have to catch the important people who are, who are committing the crime, which are the trade. So like that in wildlife trade also, there may be 10 people, 15 people, 20 people in this country, and you control them, you control the trade. You'll bring down everything. So they're not going to put the money down. So your so-called poor person who's, who's, you know, supposed to do this out of livelihood will not do it and instead will do something else more legal. Yeah, when he has nobody to sell it to, what's he going to do with it? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So two different solutions. Again, just on this, you know, there's another rise of a different type of uh, of smuggling, which is uh, smuggling of exotic animals. Like, you know, there are a lot of people uh, who come here and then take a lot of these exotic animals. Some of them even pack them in their bags, like snakes and spiders and stuff like that, and put it in their bag and put it in, take it oh, when they fly over. Yeah, um, very interesting you brought that up. I don't know what uh, experience you have, but you are right. Uh, this is increasing in India. I have no experience. <laughs> yeah, no, no, as in you may have heard of it, is what I meant. I, I didn't mean that you have experience of actually taking it in your socks. 
But um, no, uh, you see, it is very much is there and, and very much part of the international uh, smuggling thing. So, you know, when I wrote uh, textbooks to train enforcement officers in the 90s, I put all this, you know, how to check the underwear and how to check the socks, right? So people were smuggling it out even then. But it was largely a Western phenomenon. Europeans used to do it and we used to get lots of seizures. I was trained by the Dutch customs and by the British. So when I was working in, in those countries, there used to be lots of seizures. But from India, it was rare. But even those days, 90s, I, I wrote the textbooks for enforcement and, and those I had put these things. But now there's an increasing number of uh, seizures of, uh, as you rightly said, reptiles is a big thing. Spiders, tarantulas, yeah, uh, fish going out, you know, uh, ornamental fish. So this is largely pet oriented. Right. So the other one which we just talked about uh, goes into Chinese traditional medicine or goes into uh, a form of the trade which is more derivative oriented. Whereas this one is live. Yes. Uh, largely live. Largely live. Uh, and uh, largely for the pet trade. It largely goes into the US and to uh, Europe is what we believed. But now, interestingly, now that we have brought it up, there's also a phenomenon of lots of these things coming into India. With some of our wealthy people trying to do it the other way around. It was not a phenomenon in the 90s, but now. Really? Oh, wow. Uh, some of, uh, including well-known figures of, of this country, are trying to import into the country uh, stuff that is completely contraband. And they continuously seize goods. And on interrogation, you know that they are going into some of the wealthy families of this country. So there is a there is a reverse trend. We used to think India is largely a exporter. Uh, sometimes a conduit, but we were rarely an importer. In fact, in the 90s, we used to say that the only import we did was a shatush for the shatush shawls, which is Tibetan antelope, and we brought it from China. And we didn't know it. Uh, I was a foolish young boy who wrote in the early 90s that, no, no, we don't do it. We don't use any wildlife goods ourselves, you know. But we were wrong. We were taking Chinese antelope into India and making shawls and Punjabi, so wearing it, right? Rich, rich Punjabi ladies, the cognizanti of Delhi and Bombay were wearing it. And this was an illegal wildlife product, but we didn't know. Kashmiri sold it saying it's a pashmina, it's a high-grade pashmina, we didn't know. That is the only thing where we knew, where we imported. They had no use for it, we had the use for it, and we brought it. Everything else we used to blame the Chinese. But when I used to go to China in the 90s and talk about saving elephants and rhinos, they kept asking us, but, but why are you killing our Tibetan antelope? And I used to say, no, no, we don't kill any Tibetan antelope. And then I, you know, when you do research, you realize, no, no, you have to look at internally. We also have consumption. But now we are consuming live animals as well, pets. And I think that's something we need to look at. Yeah, that's, it's, I mean, on that really intriguing note, we'll just take a quick break and we'll be right back. You're listening to the Old Couple Podcast. Old Couple Pod- Podcast. A Pandemia Inc. production. Are you ready? A friendly fireside chat with friends where no topic is beyond a healthy discussion punctuated with a laugh or two. Check it out! Tune in every fortnight on your favorite podcast network. And welcome back. Uh, we have Mr. Vivek with us. And so, Vivek, you were, we were talking just before the break about uh, the whole live animal trade and especially for pets and exotic animals. There's also a huge angle of um, wet market, especially in China, that I've seen extensively, or the bush markets in Africa, which I've read in in the National Geographic um, long back. Uh, and, and then the whole issue of new diseases cropping up like coronavirus, which is the latest uh, uh, flavor of the year. But I hear there's a lot of research happening in Congo and all those bush markets researching on this transfer of diseases between animals to humans because it's such close uh, proximity that they're living and eating and cohabitating. Uh, what's what's your angle on that? Yeah, uh, interesting question and very topical, I suppose, of the times. We have always maintained when we were trying to combat wildlife trade and wildlife crime, not wildlife trade alone, because wildlife trade, a lot of it is legal. Fish, fish, it's wildlife that you catch and you trade in. It's a legal commodity. But I'm talking about illegal wildlife trade. We have been saying for a long time that one of the main issues of illegal wildlife trade is disease transmission, right? Uh, and you mentioned two different things. One is you mentioned uh, Congo or, or uh, Congo itself. I don't have experience in, but I've been extensively in Gabon and, and parts like that in West Africa, which where the moment you go, you see bushmark, the, the bushmeat trade. Um, the first mandrill I saw, the first baboon I saw of, of, of Western Africa was all on a, on a butcher table, right? And you know that some of these, especially apes, 
chimps, gorillas, which they eat. Uh, you know that they are so close to us that if they have any pathogen, they'll come into you. But um, despite uh, lots of trials by many conservationists in West Africa, they've not really made it a dent. It's largely Western and Central African oriented. But I want to stop for a second there and talk about what you said, wet market. This has become a fashionable term now. Wet market, I don't know what you mean by wet market. I think I know what you mean. But people use wet market very loosely. Most of the Malayali and the Bengali buys their fish from a wet market. Correct. <laughs> so, so it's fashionable to refer to the Chinese thing as wet market. Wet market only means where live animals are kept in a wet condition, right? In a live and wet condition. Right. Okay. So a lot of Indian markets are wet. A lot of the markets in the world are wet. Where you keep chicken and fish together is also wet market. Okay. But it is neither illegal nor may it necessarily be a major health risk as long as you are you are uh, you know adhering to safety norms that you know that human beings know because we know chicken and fish and sheep and other things. Right. Even there, you say that if you do open gutting and there's intestines and blood across. Uh, this thing, you have an ability of spreading disease. However, those diseases are diseases you know. The, the two or three issues that come in the wet market that, that you and I find abhorrent and which I, by the way, have some experience in, as I said, I was undercover in some of these countries for many years and one of my jobs was trading in those areas. So, one of these days I'm writing, I'm writing a book, one of these days I'll write the book on what you call Chinese wet market. Awesome. But anyway, now that wet market the issue in terms of disease transmission that you say are only two. One is that you're killing animals that you don't know. Right. So the, uh, the disease pathogens that escape are not that of a sheep or a fish or a chicken that human beings over the years have figured out. Because you've been eating sheep and, 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 and fish for years and whatever they, they give you, they give you a bad tummy, your tummy has figured out how to deal with it. And or health inspectors have figured out how to deal with it or doctors have figured out. These are things that you don't. Know. But more importantly, it's not that. The more important thing is that the Chinese wet markets or the Far Eastern wet markets, let's not just single out China, because there are horrific things happening in other parts of the Far East as well. The Far East wet markets are largely dependent on wildlife that they're getting from Africa and Southeast Asia and other places. Wow. So you are transporting animals across thousands of kilometers and putting them with other animals from another place thousands of kilometers away who have nothing to do with each other, who have never met each other in the wild and may transmit diseases. Things that grow together know how to live with each other. Correct. An African animal to an African animal from Nigeria may not transmit that disease because they know how to deal with that. The issue is when that disease gets spread across organisms which are several thousands of kilometers and in close proximity and the disease then spreads and sometimes you're not able to control it. That's probably what happened here as well. Having said that, I was reading the latest WHO report, which has come on, on the thing, and they're not pinning it down on the wet market at all. Hmm. There is absolutely nothing. This is the final report of the WHO on the origin of coronavirus. And I've read it uh, intimately because I was, I'm part of a group that is supposed to look at some of these things. There's nothing in it which actually pins it to a wild animal. So it may not even be. And even if it is, if you say an intermediate horseshoe bat was the first this thing, there's nothing to say that Intermediate horseshoe bat was killed and eaten in China in a wet market. Right. Probably wasn't. So some of these things are, are, are folk story, but some of these things are real. And, and we need to figure out, you know, what. So is, is wildlife trade bad? Yes, because of its harm to wildlife, one. Second, is wildlife trade bad for human health? Yes, because you're, you're moving animals which you don't know and are not used to. So we say don't eat wild meat. Eat domestic meat. It's equally, animal welfare is equally bad, right? Whatever meat you Absolutely. eat. Absolutely. But... Why are we saying it's okay to eat chicken and meat? Because that's something humans have domesticated over, over centuries. We know how to do it. Right. Yeah. We can handle it. We can handle it in terms of pathogens, in terms of uh, disease risk. Uh, whereas wildlife, we really don't know. All wildlife, forget disease. All conservation, I joke always. We are trying to conserve these animals. You keep asking NGOs. Yeah, we are trying to conserve these animals. With an encyclopedia of ignorance to guide us. We are a standing example of that ignorance. <laughs> yeah. No, we don't even... <laughs> no, I'm saying we don't even know what these things are. We don't know how many creatures there are that we're trying to save. We don't know half the things that are slipping through our hands. We don't know what they are, what will save them, what will not. Elephant we may know, a tiger we may know. Do you know, I'm the chair of the Asian Elephant Specialist Group. But there are 258 other specialist groups that I'm part of this Species Survival Commission. Some of them are dealing with species I don't even know what they are. 
The whole kingdoms called uh, Rus and Smuts. Have you even heard of them? They're just like animals and plants. There's a whole different thing called Rus and Smuts. Wow. There are tens of thousands of organisms there. I don't, I don't even know that they're there. They're not, they're not a, a, a individual or an organism. They're not a family. They are a kingdom, just like you're saying animals. There's animals, there's plants, there's fungi, then there's rust and smut. Have you heard of that? I'm sure there are going to be a lot of people are going to be Googling that, trying to figure out and wrap their head around what you just said. <laughs> this is all new. I pity the kids of the future who will have extra families and stuff to learn in their biology <laughs> yeah. class and not just animalia and plants and stuff like that. Oh my God. It's I know, isn't it? Yeah. The, things are getting complicated. But as you said, we're guided by um, uh, the Encyclopedia of Ignorance, but it's only through dialogue and research and working in the field that you increase your perimeter of ignorance as Neil deGrasse Tyson once said uh, and that's the only way to do it is by going in uh, and getting your hands dirty uh, in a good way yeah right sure. so that brings me out to the positive actions that I mean we've spoken a lot of negative angles to the whole thing which is obviously top of mind in any news media outlet but the lot of the positive actions and policies that has been implemented we've reversed like you said yeah. endangered uh, critical numbers that tigers and elephants reached and there were emergencies declared and it's work of good NGOs like you and others who have actually bought it back from that brink from an endangered to a probably more safer numbers. So, yeah. I mean, how rewarding is that work and 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 what is that high? I'm, I'm sure it is not like it happens over overnight. It takes decades. Yeah, yeah. I mean, first let me let me spread that compliment of yours from NGOs to to other sections. I mean, right. One is government. We, we we love criticizing the government, but it is because of fairly solid laws and policies of the Indian government of the past that we have what we have, right? I mean, uh, apolitically, I am saying that the, the actions taken by Indira Gandhi in the 70s set up Project Tiger, which actually saved the time. The Wildlife Protection Act was in 1972, nothing new. And it is such a strong act that it lays a foundation for all of our saving things or doing things. So a lot of government stuff, including National Parks and Sanctuary, is set up in the 60s and 70s, not done now. It really is the foundation of... Uh, uh, saving our wildlife. So you must give the government its credit. The other government you should give credit to is the forest staff who protected, especially the frontline forest. Nobody talks about that guard and that watcher who actually are the people who protect your wildlife, right? Uh, and so uh, it's not just NGOs. If those guards are not there, wildlife will disappear in India today. Even if the Indian Forest Service is not there, it may not disappear. But the, if the guards are not there, it will disappear. But the Indian Forest Service also done a, a human's job, actually. Very, very good people across the years have done lots of good also. They, you know, people like to pick at the bad, but they're excellent officers who have done a lot of good, which is why there's a lot of good. The other third compliment I want to give is to the people of India. I mean, by and large, we are not people who go out and kill and, you know, uh, want everything killed. There are segments, as I said, who want things killed. But actually, by and large, we are not. If we were parts of Africa or Southeast Asia, you would find very little left. The fact that we have this is that we have... People call it Gandhian philosophy. I don't think it's much before Gandhi also. But there's a general feeling in South, South Asia that all life has, you, know, you respect it, generally. As long as it doesn't intrude into your life, you say, let it be. You know, you don't want to go out and kill for the sake of killing and eating everything. Which is a very Southeast Asian thing, a very African thing. Tolerance levels are very low. Whereas in India, it is very, very high. I'm, I'm not saying India only, Nepal, Bhutan, Sri Lanka, you know, the South Asian continent, Bangladesh. So, uh, so that is there. Now, uh, one other thing you said is what what is is my uh, prognosis, and uh, there's something I keep saying. So you said I should tell you a story, so I, I must tell you the story. Please. You see, I'm a karma yogi. Yeah? I'm I, uh, 35 years, and people ask me, "Are you positive, pessimistic, optimistic?" You know, I say it depends on which day of the week you ask me. Monday I'm positive because it's the start of the week. Tuesday I'm not. Wednesday I'm like that. You know, Sunday I rest. Like God. <laughs> so why why this? Is when I started as a 19-year-old, I was very young. I left my home at 19. And I traveled from Punjab to Bombay. And I went to meet an old man called Salim Ali, who was then the wow. white man of India. And I left, uh, you know, options of following my father's footsteps as an engineer and, you know, taking over his factories uh, and or my mother's footsteps as a doctor of, of eminence. And I decided I'd not do anything. Took a train and went to Bombay. And I met the old man who was, who was a... 
epitome of conservation in India, and he taught me something. And uh, uh, I mean, it's a story, so it'll take five more minutes, but more worth telling. Yes. Because I uh, because I still I still give that as an answer when people ask me whether you have hope, whether things are going better or not. So when I went in there and I stood at the door as a young boy, and uh, so everybody sub said, you know, you can, uh, I opened the door, I said, can I come in? He said, so, so boy, you want to do conservation? He said, he had a bird-like voice. Mm. So he said, you want to do conservation? So I said, yes, sir. He said, you play chess? You play chess? So I was quite nonplussed. I did play chess with my father, rather badly, but I did play chess. So I said, yes, sir, I play chess. So he said, do you know, boy, conservation is a game of chess? So I didn't know it at all. But at 19, you don't say, you know, you know, you know everything. So he said, yes, sir. <laughs> so he said, uh, you know, this is a game that you can lose any moment in your life. You want to play this game? Wow. So again, foolishly, at 19, I said, yes, sir. I'm. He said, boy, you know, this is a game you may never win in your life. You still want to play. So I said, yes, sir. So he said, come in, come in, come in. Because I was still standing at the door. So he said, come in, come in. You, you can sit, you can sit. So I dragged a chair and sat opposite him. He said, okay, okay, now we'll start the game. He said, we'll start the game. But you listen, boy, he said. You won't get up and leave till the game is over. Right? I told this to two ministers who were giving up their posts. I'm not naming them. Okay? Because I've been advisor to a number of ministers of environment in India. And I told two of them who were saying, why are you doing this? You won't win. So I told the minister, you are a minister, you'll go tomorrow. I told him the story. I said, my game is not over. My job is, whichever party you are, if you're a minister of environment, my job is to come through the door and give you an offer of help. And if you take it, then my job is to advise you, right? To ensure we do something about what we have. It's an apolitical game. But my job is to do that. And so I look at the optimistic part. There's a lot of good said, a lot of good dog. I don't think we have lost it all. For example, I think there's a lot of children today who are much more aware than I was. True. Or my generation was, right? So that itself is good. You, uh, in, in my generation, I don't think you would have called me for a podcast. I mean, when I started. Right. Now you are calling me for a podcast. Pe- people know about it. Actually, awareness is much, much more. Involvement is less because we are so wrapped up in our daily shit that we know it all, but we don't want to do anything about it. So I keep telling my team also, Time has finished, 30 years, we have done awareness program. I don't want to do another awareness program in my life. I want to do participation and involvement programs. Take those aware and get them involved. A small percentage, and we can still save the world. So it's such a brilliant segue because that was the exact question which I had in my mind to ask you next is, how do we normal citizens participate and be part of this movement which is happening, right, of wildlife conservation? How do Tom, Dick and Harry, like, Dr. Sheesh and I, apart from, yeah. yes, we will donate to WTI or, or favorite organization, NGOs who are doing some great work. Please do that. Go. I, mean, I have to interrupt you when you say donate. Yeah. Always go on and click that button in uh, WTI.org.in and, and donate. Why not? Absolutely. So apart from that, uh, how else could people probably contribute? Yeah, yeah. And it's a, it's, it's a more difficult question because it is not as simple as saying I'll switch off the electricity when it's not needed or switch the water tap off or use less plastics. All these are things that people now, these are the environmental slogans, damn good, very good. All of that should be done to save the earth. They won't save your tiger or elephant. Right. None of these actions, right? So those are very specific things. So therefore, they're a little more difficult for an average citizen to always do. Okay. Having said that, I keep saying there are two sorts of actions you can do other than the third action, which you already said, which is donate to somebody who's doing good work. I will say donate to Wildlife Trust of India because I set it up, but that doesn't mean only to Wildlife Trust of India. It can be others also. Uh, look look at those who are doing good work on the ground. It's very important. Yes. And support them. So that's one way, definitely. Uh, don't only support human-related things. We all support, no? We, I do too. Education, health, but also support some nature-based thing. That's a very important thing. Which in Indian philanthropy, which we have not re- really gotten to, it's happening now. Now I can see individual donations are going on. So I think we should. But the other two ways, I mean, one way in anything, whether it's environmental, plastic or whatever, or whatever this thing is, is your own lifestyle, right? So, but by shutting the tap, you're not going to do this. But in your own lifestyle, ensure that you do not do anything to harm wildlife. 
that is an easy way to just think you need not do anything but you should not do some things right so what are those things uh, in india i i'll, I'll take, take that to three different levels one is don't eat any wildlife which people say oh no no we don't oh, come on we don't eat tigers no no but don't eat partridges also it's also protected okay all wild animals and birds and beings are protected in india except the rat and the mouse and the crow and a fruit bat one fruit bat everything else is protected so don't take anything from the wild and feed on it or or keep it at your home as a pet or anything like that right so when they come to the pet that's the second level of things don't buy wild Again, people say, "Oh, I don't buy tiger or ivory." No, no, but don't buy peacock fan feathers also. Don't buy shells. It's all wildlife. So, yeah, or parakeets from the from the market and keep in cages. So all this wildlife. Wildlife is not just tigers and elephants. Anything which is wild. Ask yourself: Is it domesticated? Is it something that that we breed in in our towns and cities? If it's not, it's wild. If it's wild, don't use it. That, so that's something that you can do. But there's a third level of this also: don't do. which most human beings don't think of which i i told you about elephants we talked about elephants but we should say about this thing. we are the ones who ask for roads we are the ones who ask for railways we are the ones who ask for linear infrastructure make sure this linear infrastructure is wildlife friendly i'm not saying don't ask for a road make sure there's a flyover where there's a forest make sure there's an underpass there's an overpass china does it for hundreds of kilometers why can't we do it we have the money we just not asking our citizenry is not asking that i want a road but can you please spend 100 crores more and put it across bandipur you can that's the cost 100 crores what is it for a nation it's for posterity that animal will go below and you go above so ask for these things which uh, i need so that's i think what you can do but when you say what can i do to volunteer you can also volunteer and help with your specific uh, skills each person may have a skill you may be a doctor but you may be a good photographer you may be right you may do something else You don't need to be an animal professional, but you can help an NGO in many ways. And if you come to our website, and or if you talk to our volunteer coordinator, he'll tell you how, how your skill sets and you can help. Everybody will not be able to do that, but many people will. So these are three ways. Lovely. I guess that's like the best piece of advice that anybody can get in how to contribute to wildlife conservation. So you've been listening to the Odd Couple podcast. This is Siddharth and Dr. Sheesh over here with Mr. Vivek Menon, who gave us some invaluable insights into wildlife conservation. Probably certain terminologies which should be used the right way, and more importantly, on how you and I can contribute either financially by making a donation, which I'll mention in the link below in our show notes. or you can visit wti.org.in to explore more options how you can contribute so thank you so much vivek for joining us and oh my god this is just uh eye opener in many different levels really i feel like it's expanded my my knowledge about stuff which i had no idea or which i had mis uh conceived ideas about you know so yeah absolutely and and i definitely have a feeling we're going to get we wake back for one more episode because i think this is worth four five episodes before even we can start scratching the surface of what he can offer to us absolutely yeah why not why why not let's talk something else next time birds for example or something else there's so much in the natural world yeah we talk so much about animals but we don't talk about plants too much and endangered plants and hopefully we'll have a chat on that separately but we'll figure that out sure so, thank you so much vivek for taking your time out no thank you for calling perfect thanks a lot mm-hmm.